We're honored to have with us here today a very distinguished guest who rearranged her schedule and left Washington, D.C. very early this morning to be here to speak to us today. And I'm glad to see her here because sometimes I don't know how the airlines can work, I tell you. <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall currently serves as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Energy Department. She has been serving in this role as second in command at the Energy Department since October 2014. She joined the Obama administration on day one, serving from 2009 to 2013 as special assistance to the president and senior director for European affairs at the National Security Council. And from 2013 to 2014 as White House coordinator for defense policy, countering weapons of mass destruction and arms control. What do you do in your spare time? <laughs> Before joining President Obama's team, Dr. Sherwood Randall worked at Stanford University, at Harvard University, and at the Council on Foreign Relations. In the Clinton administration, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia from 1994 to 1996. Dr. Sherwood Randall attended college at Harvard and then went on to graduate school at Oxford University where she was among the very early ranks of female Rhodes Scholars. After finishing her education, she began her career working for then Senator Joe Biden as Chief Advisor on Foreign and Defense Policy. Born and raised in California, she married to Dr. Jeff Randall, a neurosurgeon, and they have two teenage sons. Please give a warm welcome to U.S. Department of Energy's Deputy Secretary, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall. Good morning. I'm so honored by that very warm welcome. And I have to answer the question, what do I do in my spare time? I chase after those two teenage boys. <laughs> uh, Mike, thank you so much. As president of this proud union, you have been an advocate for investments in America's energy infrastructure, and you've helped bring the voice of utility workers to the conversation in Washington, D.C., and we're grateful for that. It is wonderful for me to be here with union leaders from across the country. And I understand that Rich Trumka will be speaking to you later today. Uh, I am very grateful for this opportunity. Now, I know that you were expecting to have standing here someone who looks more like George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> as you just heard, Secretary Moniz spent most of last month in Vienna at the negotiating table working through this historic agreement uh, that will severely constrain Iran's nuclear ambitions if it's ratified by the Senate. And so now he is up on Capitol Hill working hard to ensure that members of Congress understand why this agreement is in the national security interest of the United States and our allies and partners around the world. He would have much preferred to be here today than on Capitol Hill, but he's got to do that job. Uh, you can be assured that wherever Secretary Moniz is, your interests are very well represented in his office. Standing to my left is Dave Foster. Uh, he recruited Dave, one of the great friends of your union, to be his senior advisor. Dave had been the founder of the Blue-Green Alliance, as many of you know, and he is our senior advisor for labor and economic policy. I'm very appreciative of his having joined me here today as well, and for all that he's taught me. So, it's my privilege to be with you, and especially with some of the unsung heroes of Hurricane Sandy. My predecessor as Deputy Secretary, Dan Poneman, was the point person for the Department of Energy when Hurricane Sandy hit. I learned from him that UWUA members were on the front lines of recovery, right there with fire and rescue. You helped repair and repower New York and New Jersey and you brought scared people that first encouraging sign of recovery, which is turning the lights on in a city. My responsibilities at the department include a focus on resilience of our energy infrastructure, and I've made emergency management one of my top priorities. The president designated the Department of Energy as the sector-specific agency. 
which is Washington's policy jargon for saying that it's my job to enable you to do your job. In an emergency, DOE works with your utilities to help restore power and gas and water to affected areas. And before an emergency, most importantly, we work with your communities, with your utilities, and with you to strengthen our infrastructure and plan for response and recovery. To understand more vi vividly the challenges that you face in doing your jobs, I was in West Palm Beach in May to participate in Florida Power and Light's annual hurricane exercise. For this particular exercise, FPL simulated a Category 3 hurricane making landfall around Miami, resulting in a hypothetical 1.7 million people without electricity and nuclear power plants off from their, uh, having been cut off from their uh, outside sources of power and fuel. The exercise highlighted how dependent we are on your teams teams that are going headlong into a swirling mess of debris, downed lines, and pouring rain to assess the damage, report back, and begin the repair process. I also learned to appreciate the complex and dangerous roles you play in assessing damage and getting power restored. You are truly first responders in your service as you provide this public good to communities that may have been devastated. On top of that, there is intense pressure from community leaders and the public to get that power and gas restored quickly, with the media playing an ever-increasing role. And they may not understand the methodical process that you have to go to to keep communities and workers safe during restoration. Those risks that you take are evident to us. And what we're doing is working as your federal partner to try to support you better in doing your jobs. I especially want to thank Mike and the UWUA for your advocacy and your white paper on the lessons of Hurricane Sandy. You've helped articulate the needs for resilience and you've brought your members' experiences to the table. Hurricane Sandy put a spotlight on something that all the representatives here know and that every utility worker knows. It takes a lot to keep the lights on in America. It takes a lot to bring natural gas to towns and cities. And it takes a lot to bring clean water to homes and businesses. These are things most Americans just take for granted. Americans can get light and heat and water every time they reach for it because of you. So I'm here today to say thank you on behalf of all Americans for what you do. For all the reasons I've just described, the UWUA is an important partner in the future of the American energy economy. You see the results when our infrastructure wears out or falls short, and your boots are on the ground as our utilities modernize. At the Department of Energy, we're building long-term partnerships with America's unions, and especially those in the utility sector. We know that the UWUA has consistently joined with us, and we are deeply appreciative of what your union has done to support DOE's agenda. I want to talk a little today about the major challenges that we face in modernizing America's utilities. Quite frankly, we have a lot of work to do together, from climate change to American energy growth, infrastructure modernization to workforce development. Let's start with climate change. Climate change is no longer a threat on the horizon. It's here and it's affecting our economy every day. The UWUA knows firsthand that climate change impacts are already affecting the United States, and this extends far beyond Hurricane Sandy. Coal and nuclear plants have had to shut down or run at partial capacity when their sources of cooling water become too warm. Barges delivering coal up the Mississippi have been held up by shallow water. Drought in California has strained systems for delivering water and hydroelectric power. Secretary Moniz likes to describe the Department of Energy as America's science and technology powerhouse, and that's certainly true for our role in addressing climate change. 
Our job is to find the technology solutions and to drive innovation for the benefit of the American people. DOE's research and development helps identify new materials and technologies through research at our 17 national laboratories, as well as through competitions and grants. Then we work to demonstrate and deploy these new technologies beyond the lab through pilot projects and loan guarantees. Each of these efforts is important to successfully transitioning to a low carbon economy. And let me clear up one misconception. Low carbon does not mean no carbon. It means we use our carbon-based fuels like oil, gas, and coal differently. More on that in a minute. The second big challenge for DOE, together with labor and industry, is to boost American energy security by ensuring we have many abundant sources of energy, including a vibrant energy industry here in the United States. The President has affirmed his support for an all-of-the-above strategy, which means nuclear, wind, solar, hydro, and advanced fossil fuels like clean coal. The success of this strategy shows that we can reduce our climate impact and create jobs and energy abundance and energy security at the same time. In the United States today, we're producing more oil than we have in two decades and more natural gas than ever before. We're the largest producer in the world. In fact, we've reclaimed that lead just in the last six years. When President Obama first took office, he also set a goal to double renewable electricity from wind, solar, and geothermal sources. And within three years, we did that. We want to double that again by 2020. Thanks in part to the loan guarantees that we make available through DOE, the first new commercial nuclear reactors in the United States in over 30 years are now being built. And we've increased efficiency standards on appliances, vehicles, and federal buildings so that we need less energy to achieve the same or greater productivity. As part of the President's All of the Above strategy, DOE is investing heavily in carbon capture, utilization, and storage technologies, or CCUS. Since President Obama took office, we've invested $6 billion in CCS technologies, and we're working through another $8 billion in loans to be made available for advanced fossil energies that reduce emissions. These investments will enable fossil fuels like coal to remain competitive in a low carbon economy and can help natural gas get even cleaner. Carbon capture and storage technologies are critical to advancing the President's climate action plan, including our international partnerships. Many countries around the world, and especially developing countries, rely heavily on coal. And they will want and need carbon capture technologies to meet their climate goals. We want American technologies to serve that need. I've visited with pioneering researchers at our National Energy Technology Laboratory in Pittsburgh who are working on CCUS technologies. They're developing better and cheaper catalysts for carbon capture. And they're injecting CO2 into rocks in the lab to better understand what happens underground when we store carbon. Meanwhile, initial CCUS projects are now in the field. This year, DOE projects passed the mark of 10 million metric tons of carbon dioxide captured and stored. And perhaps even more exciting for the future of carbon capture, this year, Boundary Dam in Saskatchewan marked the first commercial retrofit of an existing power plant with CCS technology. It will capture a million tons of carbon a year and bury it underground. In the U.S., a DOE, team led, a DOE led team developed the administration CCUS tax credit proposal, now under consideration as well. This proposal is designed to put $2 billion into investment tax credits and up to $4 billion into carbon storage tax credits to incentivize utilities to make these investments under the Clean Power Plan. DOE is focused on the technologies needed for this transition to low carbon. But we also understand that big transitions like this present challenges to the American workforce. Your union has reminded this administration at each step 
that we're affecting workers' lives and that we can help make this transition easier for workers and their communities, and we have a responsibility to do so. If there's one person and one organization that deserves credit for achieving a coordinated approach to delivering federal resources to communities and workers impacted by the shutdown of coal mines and power plants, it's Mike Lamford and your union. Thank you, Mike. Mike and your union pushed for three years for this, to win this reform. When the administration announced earlier this year the creation of a multi-agency initiative, the Power Plus Plan, they could have named it the Mike Langford Power Plus Plan. His tenacious advocacy was hugely important. It helped shape the plan, which includes an initial investment by the administration of over $50 million and proposals for more in 2016. I also want to thank the UWUA for its advocacy and partnership across a broad spectrum of energy and water issues. For example, last year the Department of Energy launched an initiative to reduce methane emissions in the natural gas sector. We started with stakeholder meetings so that we could hear from industry, environmental, academic, and union leaders, including the UWUA. As a result of those conversations, DOE has focused in on four areas for improvement. First, establishing efficiency standards for natural gas compressors. Second, advancing natural gas system research and development so that utilities and workers can apply better technologies to detecting, repairing, and preventing leaks. Third, incentivizing natural gas infrastructure upgrades to help utilities recover investment costs. And fourth, encouraging state leadership for efficient distribution. DOE will join the National Association of State Regulatory Utility Commissioners in a technical partnership on this front. Together, we will enable investments for infrastructure modernization and repairs to natural gas distribution networks. DOE will provide grant funding and technical assistance to help inform decision making by state utility commissioners. The UWUA is already having a big impact. Through the Blue-Green Alliance, you took a leadership role in passing legislation in my home state of California to help accelerate pipeline replacement. These steps align with the recommendations in the recently re released Quadrennial Energy Review that Secretary Moniz referenced, which included significant input from the UWUA. The resulting QER report includes recommendations for enhancing energy infrastructure resilience, reliability, safety, and security. It's a compelling roadmap for getting from where we are on infrastructure to where we need to be. The QER recommends several actions, including establishing a competitive program of targeted funding to improve inspections, accelerate pipeline replacement, and enhance maintenance programs for natural gas distribution systems, to ease the impact on low-income consumers as utilities recover costs, DOE would establish a program to offset the impact of these incremental costs. The QER also recommends promoting grid modernization. The President's fiscal year 2016 budget includes the, be the beginning of a comprehensive grid modernization program, an in estimated investment of $3.5 billion over 10 years. I'll just pause on this to note that earlier this year I visited the Liberty substation outside of Phoenix and the brand new transformer station connecting the Palo Verde market hub with Nevada and Southern California. These vital links to our national grid are minimally protected. And in fact, the Liberty, sub the Liberty substation that I visited has experienced multiple break-ins. These two sites showcased for me how in the era in which we live and the threats we face today, we have to make sure that we are making investments in modern and more resilient infrastructure. We need to have the skills and equipment on hand to rapidly repair and restore these facilities in the event that they're attacked or vandalized, and we're going to have to work with Congress to achieve those goals. 
The QER specifically identifies high voltage transformers as critical to the grid and recommends steps that we need to take to mitigate the risks associated with losing one or more, especially because of the long procurement time associated with the procurement of those transformers. Each of the recommendations in the QER will help make our energy infrastructure stronger and more resilient against both natural and man-made events. DOE wants to work with you as we're putting these plans into action, as we're accelerating pipeline replacement, and we're pushing for grid modernization. We want to make sure that as we strengthen our infrastructure, we're also creating good-paying, family-supporting union jobs. As any proud UWUA member knows, a good paying job that lets you make your country stronger is a great job. The QER also points out that the workforce in the energy sector is expected to grow. This is a very dynamic sector of our economy. And new workers will need training. Projections indicate that by 2030, the energy sector overall will employ an additional one and a half million workers. Most of these jobs will be in construction, installation, and maintenance, and transportation as well. About 200,000 of these workers will require computer and math skills. In the utility sector, nearly 50% of the energy workforce is becoming eligible for retirement in the next 10 years, opening opportunities for a new generation of workers. In fact, projected energy industry retirements include 50% of non-nuclear power plant operators, 40% of transmission and distribution workers, more than 50% of generation maintenance technicians, and 46% of engineers. Now, I won't read you the whole chapter of the QER, though it's excellent, but it offers recommendations for enhancing training programs and apprenticeships through collaborations between the Department of Energy, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Commerce. It also gives a shout out to the UWUA for your excellent Power for America training program. P4A has helped veterans. <laughs> P4A has helped veterans to join the utility workforce as we take on replacing old natural gas pipelines, and it's a terrific model, one that we hope will be widely adopted. Last month, Secretary Moniz announced a new federal effort with a similar goal. We're calling it the Utility Industry Workforce Initiative. Through this initiative, the Departments of Energy, Labor, Defense, and Veterans Affairs, five utility trade associations, and two unions, including the UWUA, will recruit and train service members, veterans, and military spouses. We will help them connect with the programs they need to qualify for high-skilled jobs and become your brothers and sisters in the utility industry. Make no mistake, workforce training changes lives. I've seen firsthand the impact of retraining myself at community colleges I've visited all across the country. Places like Estrella Mountain College in Phoenix, Red Rocks in Colorado, Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico, and Broward College here in Florida. DOE's role is to be the catalyst that brings together the folks who want to change careers or start small businesses with the skills and training that they need to reach those opportunities, and with the employers who are looking to hire skilled workers. And since retraining is a theme of the day, I want to mention one program in particular, DOE's Solar Ready Vets program. This program based on a new regulation issued by the Department of Defense in January 2014, enables current service members to take time during their last few months of active duty to be trained on base for jobs in the solar industry. Solar company, companies have helped out by donating equipment, meaning that our soon-to-be veterans are training on the exact same equipment that solar installers are using in the field. In our pilot program, every single one of our graduates, 
transition straight into a civilian solar job. Earlier this year, President Obama announced that DOE would work with the Department of Defense to expand the Solar Ready Vets program from three military bases to ten. At the beginning of my remarks, I said that we have a lot of work to do together, and we do. Your themes for this conference might redouble as our to-do list. Retrain, reclaim, retrain, repower, and repair America. When we retrain our people, we are repowering our economy to serve our people and be competitive globally. When we repair our infrastructure, we're reclaiming our strength as the world's leading light on energy innovation and energy security. President Obama summed up our task well in his speech announcing the Solar Ready Vets program. He said, we've got to lead by example, invest in the future, train our workers for new for good new jobs in the clean energy economy. That's how we're going to keep our economy growing, and that's how we're going to create new jobs and create more opportunity for the American people. I want to thank you again for all that you do every day to make our country stronger and more significant.